Hi, I'm Eric Sipsma. I'm a uh, software engineer at Dagger and a maintainer of the open source build kit project. Uh, today I'm going to talk about modeling CI CD workflows with something called directed acyclic graphs, it's shortened to DAGs. Um, and so DAGs are an abstract concept, but they actually have very practical benefits that let us basically unify a couple different tools together um, that would otherwise be totally distinct but we can combine them and make a really powerful CI CD tool. Um, and that's the whole idea behind Dagger. So these open source tools I'm gonna to talk about are uh, called BuildKit and Q. I'm gonna talk about how they can be used on their own, what their strengths and weaknesses are, and then how they can be combined together. Uh, so yeah, I'll be available on the PlatformCon Slack channel today for any questions you might have, but let's get going here. So yeah, just a review on what's a DAG. Uh, it stands for Directed Acyclic Graph, like I said. Very fancy word just to represent a system of dependencies. So really simple, concrete example. You want to eat dinner. That's a vertex here. Uh, in order to do that, you have a dependency on cooking and doing the dishes first. So you draw what's called an edge. It's just an arrow um, between there. Uh, those vertices to represent the dependency. And then each of those can also have their own dependencies too. Um, so yeah. Really very simple at the end of the day. The acyclic part specifically means that we want satisfiable dependencies, not circular ones. So getting a job requires getting experience, requires getting a job. That's not a DAG, it's not satisfiable. Uh, we, can't, we can't deal with those. So that's why we're interested in acyclic specifically. Um, other examples of DAGs are make files, um, package managers used in Linux distros, and CI CD, which is what we're gonna be talking about here today. So yeah, each step in CI/CD, you know, build, test, deploy, um, those can be represented as vertices, and they have dependencies between each other, and those are the edges. Um, this example I'm going to be coming back to a lot, so I'll just go over it pretty quick. Um, here we have a client. Uh, so it's going to be a Go binary, and it wants to talk to a server, which is a Node.js application, um, deployed to a cloud somewhere. And so in order to release the client, we need to build it. There's a dependency there. We also want to test it first. There's a dependency there. Um, and so it's unit tests and integration tests, which will involve both the client and the server. And then the roots of all of this are, of course, the source code for the client and the server. Um, but yeah, pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. And so this is simple, but I guess there are a lot of good questions that you might be asking. So like, okay, this is a really abstract concept. How do we actually make this, you know, a real usable thing? And so one of the questions there is, how do we exchange all of this data between these different tools? You know, we have multiple languages here, presumably multiple frameworks for deploying, test, and they might not talk to each other uh, natively. So how do we make them work with each other? Uh, another question is, how do we do all of this as efficiently as possible? which I uh, will be talking about shortly. Um, I want to start with BuildKit. So it's probably most famous as the engine underneath like Docker Build X and a lot of the cool features there. But it's actually totally generic, standalone, can be used by any tool outside of the Docker context. So examples are Dagger, uh, HLB, and Earthly, among many others. Um, and so I call it a file system DAG solver because what it does is each vertex in the DAGs that you provide to BuildKit are operations performed on one or more file systems. Um, and all of the edges are basically file systems being exchanged between those ver vertices. Um, and so the DAG that you provide to BuildKit, it's in a format called LB. And so to explain that a little bit more, here's an example. Um, so here we have uh, just the client step, uh, just kind of isolating that. So there's a source op in LLB that lets you import data from an external source. Um, so here we're or importing an image that has the Go tool chain. Uh, we also want to import our actual code from GitHub. And then there's another type of um, vertice in uh, LLB called exec op. Uh, all it does is takes its inputs, runs commands uh, on top of them, and then outputs the result. So basically the original file system plus the changes you made. So here you take your go tool chain as your rootfs. You can go and mount your source code to slash src, run this command, go build, and then your output will have all of that plus the binary you just built. And so here this last step is deploying uh, that binary to an S3 bucket. That's our release here for our simple example. Um, server over here, this is gonna be the exact same structure and concept, same ops, 
except this time we're going to be use, using Yarn because we have a Node.js application here. And also going to be using Pulumi to deploy the server. And Pulumi is just a framework for deploying uh, to cloud infrastructure. Um, and you might notice there's a dependency here between test and deploy here. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. The weird part of it is that you're not exchanging data, but you do want a dependency. Um, and so keep that in mind, I'll come back to it in an example later. But yeah, and then here's just like the full LLB DAG. Here's all the client stuff we had before, all the server stuff. And now this is showing how you can combine that all together to also incorporate integration tests that use both of them. Uh, but exact same ops as before. So um, yeah, what does BuildKit actually do? Uh, like what features does it have? Like the most important, I would say, is it is very intelligent when it comes to caching and parallelization. So here I have an example where we've made a change to the client source code. And so that invalidated this Git source op. So BuildKit knows that, okay, that changed. So now I got to go rerun the unit test, got to go rebuild the client. And then it also knows that oh, I got to rerun the integration test because the client changed. But even better, it also knows that, oh, the server didn't change. So I'm just gonna use my cache result from before and go plug that into there. So what that means is that just because the client source code changed doesn't mean we need to go and rebuild the whole server. You don't need to rerun the whole DAG. You just need to rerun the vertices that have actually been impacted. Um, and so that's great in terms of efficiency, especially as you start scaling up to more and more complicated scenarios. Um, so yeah, BuildKit is uh, great, uh, but it by design doesn't do uh, something pretty important, which is let you create reusable abstractions for defining these DAGs. Um, and yeah, that is very, that's on purpose. BuildKit wants to be the low level execution engine, almost kind of like an assembly language. That's how you can think about LLB. And so then higher level tools, they can be the interface and they compile quote unquote to um, LLB format. And so that creates a nice separation of concerns. So BuildKit can take care of these details for you without having to get wrapped up in all of the higher level details of all these, you know, million different tools that might want to use it. Um, but yeah, that also leads into the other tool I want to talk about, Q. Um, so Q is a configuration language and has some unique properties that make it really good for modeling DAGs, uh, much better than some others like, you know, JSON or YAML or something like that. So one is that you can create abstractions that are importable just like a library. Um, so this lets you define vertices in a way that's reusable, uh, which is great. You know, you don't have to rewrite go build or go test or yarn test. You don't have to rewrite the implementation for all of that every single time. You can just go and import it and then use that. And the other really important part of this is um, that those definitions, those abstractions are specified as a schema, which is type checked. So that means that someone using your abstraction, you're telling, telling them, these are the inputs I'm expecting. Basically in DAG terms, these are the edges that I'm expecting coming in. And this is the shape of the data that I'm going to export out, you know, the outgoing edge. And that's great because that gives you confidence that when you're writing a configuration, it's actually valid and correct. Um, so that's cool. I'm going to go through an example in a little bit. Um, but one other thing I want to mention is that Qflow specifically is a tool uh, just right on top of Q that enables this DAG use case. And so what it does is it lets you implement a vertex in the DAG uh, that's defined using Q at least in terms of the user, but underneath it actually could be implemented any way you want. So you could call out to an external command. You can write Go code that just implements it. And that's great because that lets all of this awesome stuff Q is providing interface with external systems. Um, so that means you don't have to write everything in Q. You can just use Q to basically glue all of these other systems together. Um, yeah, and so BuildKit and Q, they're both, you know, used independently and they're both awesome. Um, but they both, I really by design, have weaknesses. So yeah, BuildKit, like I said, very low level, uh, designed for, you know, performance, not usability, kind of like an assembly, assembly language. Q, um, it, you know, great way to create abstractions, but it doesn't have all of those, you know, really advanced caching features that I was talking about with BuildKit. Um, and so, yeah, the idea of Dagger is to basically uh, use Q as the interface and then Qflow is the bridge down to BuildKit. So Q is the higher level, BuildKit is the lower level. Um, 
Yeah, and so I think the best way to really show that off is just a quick demo here. Um, so this is going to be basically what I was describing before with that CI CD example with the client and server. So client is a go binary, like I said. Um, and so here I am using Q to define some build and test steps for it. I just imported an abstraction. All I need to do is say, here's the source code. Here's the package I want to compile. It'll go and do that. And its output will be the compiled binary. Um, the binary, all it's doing is taking, um, they're doing an HTTP GET request to a server and then printing the output. Um, so really high level, really nice. Uh, the server is going to be uploaded to AWS Lambda. Um, so that accepts as input a zip file. So here I made a little zip abstraction that will just let me take my uh, input source code. And then I tell it, okay, here's the path within there that I actually want to put in the zip file. And here's the name of the zip file that I want to be output. Um, but it takes care of all the details underneath. Um, for the intake test step, I'm actually deploying uh, the server to AWS Lambda, like for real, but to a different stack. So in here I'm saying deploy to a dev stack. Um, and then I actually have a little abstraction for my intake test. All it does is uh, calls the client against the server and then make sure the client has the expected output. So very simple. Um, in the server, by the way, this is the entire implementation. It just returns the string hello from Lambda. Um, yeah, and so then uh, uploading the client, releasing it, we're just putting in an S3 bucket, nice little S3 abstract or AWS abstraction here and just specify, um, here's the command I wanna run. It'll set up the credentials from my environment variables and all of that. Uh, what I mentioned before in terms of wanting a dependency on uh, tests here. This is how we're currently doing it. So it, basically we're taking the output of the test and providing it to this step, but we don't actually use that. And this is a really good example of something where we actually want to contribute upstream to queue to make something like this a little bit easier. Right now it's kind of ugly. You know, you're mounting file systems that you don't actually end up using. Um, but that'll be great because if we contribute that upstream, I mean, we'll benefit from it, obviously, but so will probably many other users of Q um, in, you know, entirely different contexts, which is awesome. Um, but yeah, either way, so this is the uh, upload client step, just put it in S3 bucket, and then this is the uh, deploying to prod uh, step, which is the exact same thing that we did before with the intake test, except now we've said use a different uh, stack. And then there's this all target, which will run all of it, but it'll only rerun things when it actually needs to. So to explain, um, up here, I've, I wanted to save some time, so I pre-ran this. This was a clean deploy, took you know a little over two minutes. Um, and so it you know built the client, built the server, built everything. And you can see here in the Lambda console, those are our AWS Lambda functions. And here's the S3 bucket with client in it. Um, and then I reran it. Uh, it was very quick this time. Not, you know, didn't only took a couple seconds to check the cache because nothing changed. And so then I could also call the client against it and you can see, okay, yep, it actually works. But what I want to demo really quickly is what happens if I actually change the client. So I'm going to say, okay, now it's going to say foo first and then print out the uh, body returned by the, uh, the server. Um, and so I'm also going to be careful to update my intake tests. So I need to say foo here, otherwise these will fail. Um, but yeah, and so now I'm just gonna go rerun this. Um, and so the whole point here is that it's going to update everything that had to do with the client, but it will not go and you know redeploy the whole server. Um, so yeah, like, all of the server stuff didn't have to be redeployed. It already finished executing. It took a little bit longer than this step because it did have to rebuild the client and then re-export it uh, here. Uh, but now it passed and we can see, yeah, foo, hello from Lambda. So everything worked as expected. Um, yeah, so what we learned today is that CI-CD workflows are DAGs. Um, BuildKit is a DAG execution engine. Q can be used as a DAG definition language. And then Dagger is trying to unite them into one powerful platform. But each of these parts can be used, you know, by any sort of tool you want. Um, and next is really just keep building up the ecosystem. So, yeah, thank you uh, for listening. Appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, I'll be available in the PlatformCon Slack for Q&A later. Thanks.